lecture 3.5, mean value, mean free path, lambda. The equi partition theorem expanded ideal gases to include diatomic and somewhat to polyatomic. So here's what we know. When we talked about ideal gases, we said that they had no volume, that there were point particles and do not collide. Now, we've relaxed the point particle model to include volume. As soon as you say you include volume, now gases do collide with each other. So then the question really comes down to this. If you apply the ideal gas to real gases, what does that mean? So what do collisions between real gases mean? Because one of the things that we already said here is we said that we need low densities in order to qualify as an ideal gas. So we need to talk about collisions. So the simplest model of collisions is using rigid spheres. with a diameter. The, not that I did not say radius. I said diameter. So when I think about this, what's going to be really important here, so if I have, let's say that here's my gas particle. The only thing that really matters is the diameter. Yes, I know that the diameter is twice the radius, but the area of the particle is not pi r squared. The area is really pi d squared, not pi r squared. So this is not what we're looking at because a particle as it moves covers a diameter not a radius a colliding gas particle follows 
a zigzag path. So what I imagine here is that I have gas particles that are all the same size. Maybe we draw them something like this. And so now I have a gas particle that's coming in. So what's it going to do? Maybe it comes in, it hits here. Maybe it comes down here, here. It's going to have some top complicated path as this thing moves along. So the mean free path is the average distance a gas particle and travel without colliding. That's what we mean by the mean free path. So now, One can quantify when a real gas acts ideal. So if I have a large distance, If I travel a large distance before a collision, then it turns out that this approximates an ideal gas. If it travels a small distance before a collision, then it does not approximate an ideal gas. So by looking at this mean free path, it tells us this. So this is the mean free path. And that's what tells us about whether I can treat a real gas as an ideal gas or not. So now we got to look at this mathematically. This is very similar to how we calculated the number of collisions. So I'm going to say that this is an analogy. And I'm going to say, remember, the calculation or n collision per unit time. We have to do the same thing here again. So here I go. So mathematically, <clears throat> a single gas particle moves through gas sweeps out a cylinder of cross-sectional pi d squared before a collision. So as a single gas particle moves through the gas, it sweeps out a 
a cylinder of cross-sectional area pi d squared, not pi r squared. So let's look at this thing. So let me try to draw this to try to make sense of this. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to draw me a cylinder. And this is a cylinder that's sweeped out by a gas particle. Okay. So here's my cylinder now. So the cylinder is important because what I imagine is that I have this. Here is my gas particle. It's coming in. Okay. It's sweeping through this area. Okay. I'm not going to draw it that big, but it's sweeping through this area. So what I know here is that this is the area that it sweeps out in. So the area here is pi d squared. Now, as the particle moves, it's moving at some speed, which I'm going to say is v rms. So the language of speed is tricky. So now what happens is that I have gas particles that are in the way. Maybe I shouldn't draw it there, but you could imagine that they're, they're really just everywhere. So here's my gas particles. So then this is the the gas, and then what you're going to see here is that this particle travels a distance now. Okay, so this distance, what we called last time, was delta x, and this was the, the speed at which it actually moves through this. Now, we got to be careful. There are two speeds. So there's the RMS speed of the gas particle, but there's the relative speed of the gases that are moving. So this is the speed relative to the gases because they're all moving. So this is the spanned volume Okay, so this is the, um, I'm sorry, it's not the volume, but this is the distance. This, let me be careful. This here, this volume, this is the spanned volume of a cylinder. by the red gas particle. And what we're going to see here is that this volume is then going to be the area times this distance delta x. Again, this is the same argument used in n collisions per unit time. It's that spanned volume. And then one other number here that we need to pay attention to here. So let me be careful here. So I should be writing some of this thing. So this guy, they're moving at some relative speed. 
relative to the red gas particle. So I think I have everything. So now let's look at the mean free path. So the mean free path then looks like this. It's the number of collisions in time delta t. So how did we calculate this last time? We looked at the number density of the gas. Then this was the spanned volume. Okay, so then if here, what I'm gonna do here is that this is going to be the length of path during time delta t. So here we go. Let's try to do that. So the path length depends on the RMS speed of the gas particle. So this should be V RMS times delta T. So now if I start to put this all together, then it looks like this. So then I'm gonna get the number density. The spanned volume is then going to be the area, which is pi D squared. And then I'm gonna get V relative times delta t. That's the volume right there, right? So this here right here is the spanned volume. And then this is going to be v RMS delta t. Now, this is going to get tricky here. It turns out that there's a, that the relative speed and the RMS speed are connected to each other. So right away, you can see that the time is canceling out, but now I have to connect these two. So it turns out that V RMS over V relative is one over the square root of two. So that deals with the connection between these two. So now if I now put this together, here's what I get. I'm gonna get the square root of two pi d squared n divided by volume and then Divide it into one. That's typically not the way it's written. So what you're seeing here is that this is diameter right there. So it's typically written in the radius form. And as a consequence, you get a value that now reads four times the square root of two, because I'm replacing D with two R, then it's gonna be pi R squared and V one, and this is the mean free path. So the trickiest thing I think is relating V RMS to V relative, and then remembering that we had the same argument that we did before. So let's try to interpret this now. Okay, so now we wanna interpret this. Apparently, I can't change the color of this gun. Oh, let me try to do this. Okay. So now let's interpret this. Now, 
physically, a simple analogy is riding in bumper cars at the boardwalk. You can only travel a short distance on average, that is, before being involved in a collision with another bumper car. So if you look at the mean free path equation, you could see that it depends on area. So what we're looking at is we're looking at this guy now. So if I look at this, we have an area dependence and we have a density dependence. So what we're seeing here is that what happens? So if two molecules collide, their distance between their centers is less than D, which is equal to 2R. So I imagine, here's my gas particle. And this argument is that all particles have to have the same, same size. So then if I have another gas particle here, if this guy, trying to draw them the same. So as this guy is coming here, if this distance between these two, okay, so again, here's this speed coming in with VMR speed. So, this distance is less than d equals to 2r. There is a collision. So what I imagine here, so now I have gas particles. So what I'll try to do here is that I imagine that I have gas particles, let's say, right here. And let's say that this one's right here. So what I imagine here, again, all these gas particles are moving. But here's what I'm imagining here. So I have a cylinder that's being, let's say, it's expanding out. So when I'm looking at this guy, I imagine that this guy kind of comes like this. So as it comes here, if it's less than that, then what you're seeing here is that then this particle does something like this. And it has this little volume that it's it's sort of like coming in here. So what I should have done is I should have maybe done this a little bit better. 
and saying that this is sort of like the cylinder that it's entering here. So what you're seeing here is that it's coming in at some speed and it's expanding here and now their centers are less than 2R and then they continue to move and then it continues to move along its path right here. So this is what I mean by a cylinder of diameter D equals to 2R or width, however you want to talk about it. So now to look at the area dependence, if we have larger particles in the gas, then I'm going to have more collisions. They take up more of the volume. Therefore, I'm going to have a shorter mean free path because it looks, I have a bigger area. So if I look at these gas particles, I could imagine here is that it's looking something like this. And so what happens here, as my particle comes in and it collides, well, because the packing density is so high, then you're going to see here is that you're going to get lots of, you know, zigzag paths before it comes out. On the other hand, if I have smaller particles, I'm going to have less collisions. And so therefore, I can travel a longer distance. So therefore, this guy increases. Why? Because its area of the gas particles is smaller. So then, if I look at my gas particles again, then if I look at, if I have the exact same scenario here, and now this guy is just a little tiny guy. So you could imagine that it's gonna travel farther and therefore have a longer distance that it can do this. I mean, we could imagine this following scenario here. So as an analogy, let's say that we're walking through a crowd. So if the crowd are large sumo wrestlers, your probability of bumping into one player is higher than
then going through a crowd of skinny models. Now remember, this is analogy. It's the particle that should change, not the gas. So now, here's what I envision here. So I have a whole bunch of, uh, so my density has to be the same. Okay, so if I look at this guy, so how do you draw a sumo wrestler? Say this is a sumo wrestler. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to copy this. And then I'm going to start just repeating the process here. So now if I just copy all of these, I'll just do a couple of iterations. You could imagine, here's my sumo wrestlers right here. Now, as I look at this thing, I have a gas particle that's going to be moving through these guys. So the fact that they're larger means that I'm likely to have numerous collisions trying to get through them to get out. So in this case, I'm going to have a shorter collision distance. But what if I had skinny models? Now, I'm not really sure how to draw skinny models either. So you could imagine that these are models. Are they about the same size? Yeah. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing. Oops, not that. So if I copy this and I set this up, then I'm going to set it up something like this. Here. So assuming that the number density is about the same, Now I'll just do this one more time and then stop. So what you're seeing here is that I have this scenario. So now if I have my gas particle coming in, it's likely that I'm gonna travel a farther distance with less collisions. So then we say that this is going to be a longer collision distance. So then I'm going to look at the following thing here, which is our second piece here, and this is the number density dependence. So then a gas particle can encounter two extreme number densities.
one of them is that I can have less particles per volume like this. So then when I look at my gas particle coming in, we're seeing here is that it's gonna travel a, a farther distance by far. So then I'm gonna have a lower number density, which then means I have less collisions, which then gives me a longer mean free path because the number density is small in the denominator. On the other hand, I could have a higher density. So if I'm now looking at my particle coming in, we're seeing here is that because the number density is higher, I'm going to have more collisions. So now I have a higher number density. So therefore, I have more collisions. So then this is going to give me a shorter mean free path because the number density is large. And, you know, there's lots of analogies that we can use here. Okay, one good analogy is that if one drives along a highway, with hardly any cars on the road, your mean free path is long. Do you interact less with the cars? On the other hand, driving during rush hour um, implies a very short mean free path you're interacting more with the cars so you know there's another example is that at room temperature we've already seen that gases typically move around 500 meters a second that's a thousand miles an hour so if you open up a bottle of perfume, the scent will not reach you quickly because its mean free path is quite small at standard temperature and pressure. It's very short. In fact, if I remember correctly, it's to the orders of nanometers. So the number of collisions indicated by the short you know, the fact that the smell is getting to after a while indicates that that's a short mean free path, which means that there's a lag time. And when you open the perfume to when you smell it. But it's the same type of thing. So now let me uh, say that that in general. The mean free path is 
equation is not in its most useful form. Because one needs the number density. And divided by the volume. This is usually not given in problems. But we can use the ideal gas law. So from the ideal gas law, replace. So if I look at this, this is PV, and I'm going to use the per molecule form of the ideal gas law. We can replace the number density by this expression that reads KBT and to pressure. So that means that I can replace this to read 4 times the square root of 2 pi r squared pressure in the denominator. And now I have KB T in the numerator. And you could see here is that now this is proportional to T and P. This is the most useful form. And we can interpret this pressure and temperature difference. It's the same thing that we've already done here. So now let's interpret the mean free path with temperature and pressure dependence. It, it really is the same of what we already said here. So let's check this out. So if I increase temperature, what does that mean? I now have a higher KRMS for all of the gas particles. Therefore, it means that the gas spreads out more. So therefore, this increases lambda. Okay, it increases lambda. On the other hand, if I decrease temperature, then that means that I now have a lower KRMS for the gas. So therefore, the gas spreads out less. So they're all, the density is now higher. So therefore, that decreases lambda. And we could say the same thing for pressure here. So if I look at pressure, if I increase pressure, then that implies that I'm forcing the gas to have a higher density. which then means that I'm going to have more collisions. So in this case, it decreases the mean free path. On the other hand, if I decrease pressure, then I'm going to have a lower density, 
and therefore I then increase the mean free path. 